Well, turn your Bibles tonight to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, if you would. We'll be looking at verse 1. We'll begin reading there, Matthew chapter 9, verse 1. You find that in your Bible. We'll read along with me as I read it for you, reading the first seven verses. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. Behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. For whether it's easier to say thy sins, oh, I'm sorry, be forgiven thee, or to say arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight as we come together in this place. We thank you for everyone who has made the extra effort it takes on a Wednesday night to come out from a busy day and a busy schedule. Now, Father, I understand uh, the extra effort it takes, and I pray you'd bless them for it. I pray you'd encourage all of us from your word and guide us and direct us in our path and order our steps, my Father, tonight. I pray that you'd open the lips of your servant to speak by your spirit and the heart of every person whether they are present in this place or whether they're listening or watching, that, Father, you might minister to all of us by your Spirit, through your Word, and we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Wednesday, unbeknown to me, we started a little mini-series of messages with a, a message entitled, Gravitas. In that message, the point was having a worthy walk. And so I feel led to take the next couple of weeks to, to outline and describe just what a worthy walk is defined as by the Word of God. Uh, it's, it's a tall order. God gives us a tall order in the Word of God. God has expectations of us, and uh, they're pretty high expectations. And I guess, you know, if you don't set the bar high, nobody's going to rise very high. And so God has, in His Word, set a walk, a life that each of us should be living. And it has certain qualities to it that ought to be part of our life. And that's what we're going to look at in the next couple of weeks. And we find in Matthew chapter 9, in verse 5, that the Lord Jesus was dealing with a crippled man. And this man represents the sinner who is paralyzed spiritually and cannot walk worthy or pleasing to God. Before we were saved, we couldn't walk worthy of the Lord. This man with this physical paralysis was healed by the Lord and was made able to walk. When the sinner comes to Christ as Savior and places all of his or her faith in Him and Him alone for salvation, just like uh, this palsied man, he had no hope of ever being healed. He had no hope of ever being cured. He had no hope of ever walking again. Jesus was his only hope. And that's how we have to come to the place in our life spiritually. We have to understand that we're sinners, we're lost on our way to hell, and we have no hope or paralyzed spiritually. And Jesus is our only hope. He said, I am the way. The truth and life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so when we come to Christ as sinners, He forgives our sins and we are spiritually healed. Hence the meaning of Isaiah 53, 5 where He said, But He was wounded for our transgressions, He was bruised for our iniquity, the chastisement of our peace was upon Him, listen, and with His stripes we are healed. He wasn't talking physically, He was talking spiritually. And it's confirmed by the Apostle Peter speaking of Christ, 
when he penned 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He said this, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. So he's taking the quote of Isaiah and he's applying it to the, the, the spiritual, isn't he? Friends, we cannot be healed from the malady, the paralyzing spiritual malady of sin, except by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only hope. Notice what the Lord said to the man. He said, thy sins be forgiven. Arise and what? Arise and walk. In other words, you are forgiven and healed. Now get up and walk as a result. How was the man? The man was paralyzed, right? He couldn't walk. Jesus forgave his sins. Jesus healed him. And now that you are healed, walk. The Lord Jesus, in effect, says the same thing to the believer. The one who's been forgiven, the one who's been saved, the one who's been born again. Because we have been forgiven and healed, we are to arise and walk spiritually, aren't we? And we're to walk physically. I mean, our life is our walk. Because we have been forgiven and healed, we too are to arise and walk. So we shall see how far this message will go tonight. I don't know if I'll get it done. I won't belabor you here too long, but I'll, I will get to a point, and if I'm not done, we'll just quit, and we'll pick it up again next week, all right? But we want to look at what makes a worthy walk. What are the ingredients of a worthy walk? We need to take our walk, our life, the way we live, and we need to compare it to what the Bible says should be our life, should be our walk. Not what the world says should be our life and our walk. Not what our friends think our walk ought to be. Not what our, you know, anybody else, but what God says it ought to be. God's got a blueprint here. God's got a plan. And so let's look at the first point tonight. We're looking at the worthy walk, and we're going to look, number one, at the call. Matthew 9, 5, the call is this, arise and walk. Now this walk is to be compatible with the miracle that has taken place. And the condition that the healed now finds him or herself in. 1 Thessalonians 2, 12 says, for ye that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. The Bible says we're supposed to walk worthy of God. So our life, our walk, our living should be more and more worthy of God. We're not called to sit around. We're not called to play around. We're not called to mope around. We're called to get up and go. Arise and walk. We're called to be doers of the word in James 1.22. We're called to be laborers together with God in 1 Corinthians 3.9. We're called to be always abounding in the work of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15.58. We are called to go into all the world in Mark 16.15. See, those are, those are action things, aren't they? You know, this, this guy got saved, now he's just not going to sit there the rest of his life. We... We got saved, we're not supposed to sit around the rest of our life. Sometimes, you know, Christians are happy to just sit in church all the time and just soak up everything, but never go do anything with it. There are so many commands in the, in the New Testament that have action involved, doing and going and, and speaking and witnessing and helping and living. That's the call. And so our call, since we have been healed spiritually since we've been saved since our sins have been forgiven is to rise and walk all right let's look at number two the character the character of the worthy walk as i said before this walk should have a certain character that is compatible with the miracle which made it possible think about it the miracle it took a miracle to save your soul it took a miracle for, you to, for your sins to be forgiven. It took the miracle of God leaving the glories of heaven and coming to earth and becoming a man. That's a miracle. It's called the miracle of miracles. 
A virgin had to conceive a child. That's a miracle. And this child was God in the flesh. That's a miracle. And, and then God had to die on the cross as our substitute to pay our sin. That's a miracle. He rose from the dead. That's a miracle. And then in, at one moment in time, he came into your life and he forgave your sins and saved your soul and gave you eternal life. That's a miracle. We lose sight of the miracle that God has done to save us so that we can go to heaven. It's incredible. We're living, walking, talking, breathing miracles. You know, we look and we, we look at a, the new birth of a baby, we go, oh, the miracle of life. It is a miracle. But you know, you're even a greater miracle. Because you've been born twice, amen? Once physically and once spiritually by trusting Christ as Savior. And so our life, our walk, ought to be compatible with the miracle that it took to give us this life in Christ. Remember, we were spiritually crippled and have been healed and set free and called to walk. So let me give you some things that should be the character of our walk as Christians. Now, I'm not going to be turning to all these scriptures because I've got like a, a zillion scriptures here and it would take us forever to, to turn to them all. So I just have them all written down. So just listen to me, okay? Number one, what is the character of our worthy walk? Number one, newness. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. It's a new life. It's not the old life. Old is different than new, amen? Just as this man in our passage... Listen, this man received brand new legs. This wasn't, you know, lower back ailment. This wasn't migraine headache. This was a man who could not walk. His little legs were all shriveled up, and God gave him brand new legs. What a miracle. You and I have received a brand new life. Pretty exciting, isn't it? Do you think that perhaps this man walked with a joy that others did not have? Mm -hmm. Do you, you think perhaps this man walked uh, with an appreciation of walking that other people didn't have? Do you think he would waste very much of his time just lying around doing nothing? That's all he did all his, all his life up till now. He just laid around and did nothing. You think if he had new legs, he's just going to do that the rest of his life? No, you know what he said? You can just hear him, can't you? He said, I got these brand new legs. Man, I'm never going to sit down again. I'm only going to lay down to get some sleep so I can get back up and walk again. Amen? Listen, we have new life in Christ. We ought to have an attitude that like, you know what? I'm never going to live that old life again. Boy, I got this brand new life every morning. We ought to wake up and say, man, I got a new life to live in Christ. You think that every time he took a step, he thought of Jesus? I think he did, don't you? Every time he would step, I can only do that because of Jesus. Oh, I can only do that because of Jesus. You think he ever forgot about Jesus? I don't think so. Every, you know, every day we ought to think about Jesus. Every day we ought to live and say, thank you, Lord, for the new life you've given me in Christ. And so we ought to have a newness about us. Not the same old, same old of the world, but a newness. You know, when I got saved, God gave me a new life. He made a, he, he made a new me. I mean, I am right now, I am so new... Compared to what I was before I got saved, you wouldn't even know me if I stood next to myself. Yeah. yeah. If the old me was standing up here, you wouldn't know we were related. And if you saw the life the old me lived and the life that God's given me in Christ, it's so, it's so new and crisp. 
Like getting your shirt back from the dry cleaner with the extra starch in the collar, amen? Boy, you ever get new sheets? Oh, don't they feel great? I love to get in bed with them new sheets. I got me a new life. We got to live it every day. Got to be a newness. Number two. The second thing. So, so we look at our life and we say, you know what? Am I walking worthy of the Lord? Do I have a newness about me? Do I have a new car smell about my life? Or do I stink like the rest of the world? But then number two, there ought to, we ought, part of our walk ought to be honesty. Romans chapter 13, 13 says, let us walk honestly as in the day. And so he's saying, you know, you know, people walk differently in the day than they walk at night. Let me read the rest of the verse. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. People walk different in the daytime than they walk at night. You just stay at my house for a while, sit on my front porch, you'll see it. I live across the street from a bar. People in the daytime, they walk by, they're normal. All of a sudden it gets dark and they're like... They walk different at night. You know what? Our, our, our neighborhood isn't corroded with cars in the daytime. But at night they are. Why? Because people do different things in the dark than they do in the light. They all come there at night, and they all get drunk at night, and they all go home in the night. And he says here, we're supposed to walk honestly as in the day. We should be honest people. Our word ought to be good. Our handshake ought to be our bond. We ought to be honest. When we're, when we're dealing with others, we ought to have honesty as a policy. 1 Thessalonians 4.12 says that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without. It's talking about the people that are outside, the people that aren't, haven't yet gotten saved, the people that haven't yet trusted Christ. We're supposed to walk honestly with them. They should know that a born-again Christian, they can count on that Christian to be honest. You know? That means, you know, I've sold a lot of vehicles as a Christian. And I always want to make sure I tell them what's right and what's wrong with it. What's right with it, I always brag on what's right about it, right? But then you got to tell them what's wrong with it, too. You do? Well, how's it run? Oh, great, great, great. It runs great. Never gives me any trouble. Well, you know that's not true. The thing just broke down last week. You got, a, you got a rubber band and a piece of tape keeping that thing going. got to be honest. Honesty. Number three, the, third, ingredient, the three, third characteristic of our walk, our life, ought to be we ought to walk circumspectly. Ephesians chapter three, 5, verse 15. Ephesians 5, 15 says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Circumspectly. What does that mean? Circumspectly means precisely. There ought to be a precision about our, our walk. That means we walk on purpose. Right? We go where we go on purpose, and we don't go where we don't go on purpose. And we have reasons for why we don't go here, or don't go there, or don't do this, or don't do that. We're, not, we're just not following you know, a bunch of do's and don'ts. I hear that all the time. Oh, you Bible believers, you got all these do's and don'ts. Man, if you've got troubles with do's and don'ts, you're way down. You, you, you really don't understand. You really don't understand. I, I can do anything I want to do. If I want to live with the consequences of them. You see, if I, I can go out and do whatever I want to do tonight and, I'm never, and I won't lose my salvation. Why? Because my salvation isn't based on what I do. My salvation is based on what he did. Amen. Once the debt's paid, it's paid. They can't say, oops, well, you know, you ran the red light, so we're bringing all your tickets back out, and you've got to pay for them all again. Uh-uh. You pay the, once your ticket's paid, that ticket's gone. He paid for my sin. When I trusted him as my Savior, he wrote, paid in full on my sin debt. I don't have do's and don'ts because for people, 
It's do's and don'ts for him. You know, we should have a preciseness to our walk, a precision to our walk. The word circumspectly means accurately. It means uprightly. We ought to walk uprightly. And then it also means exactly. There ought to be a straightness to our walk, a purpose and a definite precision like a fine running watch. Number four. There ought to be a brilliance, a brilliance about our walk. Ephesians 5.8 says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. The Bible says that he, he, he translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Before we were saved, we walked in darkness. We lived in darkness. We got up in darkness. We lived in darkness. We went to bed in darkness. I don't care how sunny it was. We were in darkness spiritually. Do you understand? We were in darkness morally and, and ethically and, 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 and because of our sin. And when he saved us, he translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. The Bible says God is light and in him is no darkness at all. We're his children. There ought to be a brilliance about our life. There ought to be an, a cleanness, an a, a openness, a, 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 a clarity about our life. We're supposed to shine for Jesus, aren't we? Amen. Did we sing that tonight? No, we didn't sing that tonight, did we? Yeah, I thought I, thought I heard that just recently. That little light for Jesus we're supposed to shine. You in your small corner and I in mine. We all have a little corner. How bright is your corner? You know, I mean, do people, do people know there's something different about you? Do people know that, you know, I remember, and I, I tell these stories all the time, I'm sorry, but there might be one person that's watching that never heard it before. But when I was working um, at Kaiser Aluminum, um, I remember I was working this saw, and I'm cutting the pieces, and I looked over, and there's this guy standing there staring at me. I'm thinking, okay, maybe he's on break or something. I look back, he's gone. I said, okay. I, I'm working again. I look, at there he is again. He's staring at me. And that went on for a while. And finally, I went up to the guy. I said, hey, I said, can I help you? I'm t this is the honest truth before the Lord. He said, no. I said, well, then why do you keep standing there staring at me? He says, I don't know. He said, I'm trying to figure it out. He said, there's just something different about you. Aww. I'm thinking, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I was hoping it was my testimony for Jesus. I hope he saw Jesus in me, amen? One guy came up to me at work, and I, I was reading, and he says, and this was like, the, you know, yeah, there's those guys that are mean and they think they're tough and, you know, they got to prove to everybody how rough and tough and mean they are. And they're really just scared little rabbits inside, really. But anyway, he comes, you know, what you reading? It's in the Bible. What do you read that for? I told him what I read it for. By the time I was done, he goes, oh. But see, you know, there ought to be a brilliance about our life. There ought to be a shine to it. You know, when you, you know, when you get something, when you, I don't know how you are, but if, when I buy a used car, I take it home, I clean it all up. You know, I'll, I'll armor all everything, I'll sweep it out, and I'll wax it all up on the outside and make it all nice and shiny because and, it's my new car. Well, we got new life. We ought to have a shine to it. You know what Jesus did when he got you? He found you. The Bible says he pulled you up out of the miry clay. And he set your feet upon a rock. Amen. He pulled me up out of the muck and the mire of my sinful life, out of the darkness of this world, and he washed me in the blood of Jesus. And he cleansed me from all my sin. And he shined me up. I just want to keep shining. Amen. See, I just want my life to be shiny for Jesus. I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, none of us are perfect, but we can be shiny, amen? Yeah. We can keep our lives clean and, and shine for Jesus. 
walking in the light as he is in the light. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. We're to walk as his children. You've heard the phrase like father, like son. That's how it ought to be. We ought to be like our father. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You're not going to be able to be uh, having a brilliant life if you don't have the word of God. You know, just think about this now. Here's the Bible. All right, now watch, now watch. See that? It's a light, isn't it? It's a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. Huh? Every time you open up the Bible, it's light. Spiritual. Man, you've you, you got to wear sunglasses to read this thing. You know what I mean? And, when, and it's a light that's supposed to shine on our path. It shows us where to go, how to go, what to do, what not to do. It's helping us navigate the obstacles and the pitfalls and the snares of life. Man, we got a guide here. Something, and if we just pay attention to it, it's a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. We're to walk according to the word of God. Why? Because we're the children of light, and his word is a light. So not only is there the call and the character of our walk, but then there's also... And this is the long one, so I don't know if we'll get through it tonight. There is the course, the course of our walk. As believers in Christ and children of God, our walk should follow a different course than it did before we knew the Lord. As I said, my life is different than it used to be, and I'm, I'm so glad. Look, I look back at the life I lived before I got saved. I am so, I'm just telling you from my heart, I am so glad. I'm not living that life. I am so glad Jesus saved me. I'm so glad he changed me. I'm so glad he, he put me on a different path, a different course of life. I'm telling you, I'd, I'd be a nowhere man with nothing worn for Jesus. I, I, you, know, you, you know I was a rock and roll musician and I was trying to be, a, a, I was trying to be famous and all that kind of stuff. And I, I remember I just... Uh, I don't know, maybe last year sometime, there's a, there's a building close to here, and I wanted to go look at it, see if the print shop could go up there. And So I went and talked to the guy, and he said, well, uh, I'll meet you there, such and such a time. And he took me through the building, and uh, we go into this area of the building, and there's all these guitars and drums and, and, and stuff and sleeping bags on the floor. And he said, yeah, this is a rock group, and they're, they're going to make a studio here. And I chuckled with him myself. I said, these, they're not going to make no studio here. Give me a break. And they never did. But a couple of days later, I, was, I saw the guys who ha, whose equipment it was. They were standing out front, and they were all guys, like in their 50s, you know. They're all bald in the front, got the great big gray ponytails going down the back. And I said to my wife, I said, that's me. Without Jesus, that's me. That's what I would be, a has-been, nowhere going, doing nothing guy, still in somebody's basement or in somebody's room, practicing with my little guitar and my drums. I'm going to be big one of these days. We're going to be famous someday. We're going to make it someday. We're going to die. I mean, that's, that's what I would... It, it, I just looked at it and I said to my wife, I am so glad Jesus saved me. Amen. Man. So let me suggest several things that should make up the course in which we walk a worthy walk. Did I tell you I'm glad I'm saved? Did I tell you that? Amen. Number one, this is the course. The Bible says this is the way, walk ye in it. Walk ye what? In it. In it. All right, so how are we supposed to walk? Number one, in love. Ephesians 5.2 says, and walk in love. As Christ also hath loved us and given himself for us. So walk in love. You know, you walk in the middle of the street, right? So love is, is like a way, we're, that's the way we're supposed, this is the way, walk in it. 
love. We're supposed to walk in love. We need to get in the love rut. Well, I'm in a rut. Yeah, if you're in the right rut, you're okay. Amen? We need to, we need to walk in love. 2 John 1, 6, and this is love. How do you know if you're walking in love? And this is love that we walk after his commandments. Didn't Jesus say, if you love me, keep my commandments. So he says, walk in love. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. You see, we, we live the way we live because we love Jesus. We do what we do because we love Jesus. We don't go there and do all that stuff. Well, the do's and don'ts aren't a matter of law, they're a matter of love. Why are you the way you are? Because I love Jesus. Why are you faithful to your wife? Because I love her. Why are you nice to your wife? Because I love her. Same with Jesus. Well, I'm nice to my wife because I took that vow. Man, oh man, sickness and the health and all that stuff. Yeah, I'm doing it. What good is that? It's love, isn't it? Not duty. Love, not law. We walk in love. I've told you many times that God is love. And if we're going to walk in love, it will have to be the love of God as described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It would do us all good to go over the description of love found there and compare our life and our love to it to see if we are walking in the love of God or if we're walking in the love of man. I think we, I don't know how many people really go back to 1 Corinthians 13 and read that over and over again and look at the different words and, and study them out and find out what, you know, what it all talks about. But when you walk in love, that's the course. We should walk in the path of love. Number two, in truth. We should walk in the path of truth. 2 John 1, 4 says, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. So here's that word commandment again. We're to walk in the truth. God, our Father, said this, walk in the truth. Why do fathers do that? Because they want their children to be safe and secure and successful, don't they? And fathers, believe it or not, kids, fathers have some wisdom. So you see, they walked before a lot more years than you've walked. And they've made all kinds of mistakes and done all kinds of dumb things. Gotten themselves in all kinds of problems, all kinds of troubles and situations. And all they're trying to do is help you so that you don't go down the same road, waste the same time and the same resources. And have the same heartaches and the same memories and the same scars. So they say, you know what? Do this and do that. And don't do this and don't do that. And walk this way and walk that way. Why? Because they love you and they care about you. And they want you to be successful and safe and secure. That's why God said, walk in my commandments. Walk in the truth. Because if you walk in the truth, you'll be safe. You'll be secure. You'll be successful. You're supposed to walk in truth. John 17, 17 says, thy word is truth. There it is again. It keeps coming back to this book, doesn't it? it? keeps coming back to the word of God. You cannot live the Christian life. You cannot walk the worthy walk without the book. You know, it's like trying to run a race, but nobody ever told you where the course was. But you got to run it. And if you get outside of it, you know, God gives us the course right here. Here's one. We should walk in integrity. Integrity. Psalm 26, 1. David said, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. I've walked, you know, it sounds like he's bragging, but he's not bragging. He says, I've walked in my integrity. The word integrity in the Hebrew is the word tomah. It means moral innocence. He said, Lord, I've walked in moral innocence. I've walked in integrity. I've been upright and I've walked clean before you. 
We have to have integrity, don't we? People of God. Proverbs 27 says, The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. What's he saying? He's saying, parents, it's not enough to tell your kids what to do and what not to do. You have to show them what to do and what not to do. They need to have a moral guide. Right? David said, I've walked in my integrity. I've walked in my moral innocence. I've walked uprightly before God. Now he's saying, and then the Bible says that if you walk in integrity, your children will be blessed after you. That means they follow after you. Children will mimic or pattern, whether they want to or not, to one degree or another, their father. And if their father is walking in integrity, then the children, for the most part, will learn integrity. If you're walking in honesty, your children will learn honesty. Do you see how it works? Now, my father wasn't a saved man, but he walked in integrity. And he was a, he was a disciplinarian and all the things that kids don't like. All the things I didn't like. But all the things I'm thankful for now. Because my father, God used my father to shape many of my characteristics. I didn't even know it. Even the ones I didn't like about him became part of me and ended up being good. Because now I see him from an adult perspective instead of seeing him from the child perspective. You get it? And so I'm thankful for the integrity of my father. Why? Because it I've been blessed walking after him. That word after means to follow after, to walk in the same step. See? So, listen, young people. If you have a father that has integrity, be like him. You don't have to like everything, but be like him. Because you'll be blessed if you are. Number four, we might get through these. I'm going to go try to go fast here. Number four, Acts chapter 9, verse 31. We should, the course should be, we should be walking in fear. The Bible says, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost multiplied. They were walking in the fear of the Lord. Psalm 111, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if you don't have the fear of the Lord, you don't have even the beginning of wisdom. And then Colossians 4, 5 says, walk in wisdom. So how am I going to walk in wisdom? If I'm going to walk in wisdom, I've got to walk in the fear of the Lord because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you don't fear God, you're not going to have wisdom. It's not talking about a trepidation. It's not talking about horror. It's talking about reverential respect and awe and admiration and a holy fear. Number five. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. We just read it. It said, walk in the fear of the Lord. Then it said, and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. We need to walk in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says God is the God of all comfort. The Bible says we're to comfort others with the comfort wherewith we ourselves have been comforted of God. My dear friends, we should walk in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, not in the comfort of of, of the world, not in the comfort of things, not in the comfort of substances, but in the comfort of of the Holy Spirit. Wow, the Holy Spirit can give great comfort. Number six, in spirit. Galatians 5.25, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. That means being spirit controlled. That means being spirit filled. Number seven, we're supposed to walk in good works. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We should be walking in good works. Number eight, in Christ. Colossians 2.6, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Walking in Christ, what does that mean? 1 John 2.6, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Walking in Christ means I'm walking as he walked. It means I'm walking in the footsteps of Jesus. It means I'm patterning my, patterning my life after him. And where do I find him? In the word again. There we are. 
Is Jesus the one you pattern your life after? Is he the one that's out front? Is he the one that you want to be like the most? Number nine, we walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is believing and trusting God. Faith is holding God's hand in the dark. There used to be a, used to be a ride when I was a young person down in, at Kennywood in Pittsburgh called Laugh in the Dark. I was just a little kid. It was one of them boats that go through, you know, and they got all these scary things, and it's all black, light, and dark. I don't know. I never knew why they called it Laugh in the Dark, because it always made me cry. I was scared to death of the laugh in the dark. Can you imagine that? I always just astounded me why they would dare to call it laugh in the dark when it scared you half to death. But when I would go through there, I would feel, I would feel so safe if I just held my dad's hand. Because I knew as long as I was holding his hand, all these scary things weren't going to get me. You know, all these scary things weren't going to hurt me. Well, that's what we need to do with the Father. That's walking by faith. It's holding on to his, we're just little children. It's holding on to the Father's hand, you know. We, when you hold on to the Father, here's how little kids hold on to the Father's hand. Right? They don't know where they're going. They're looking all around. They could walk out in front of a car if it went for the Father's hand, right? You know, and then they step off of the curb and their little legs are dangling in the air because the Father's holding them up because they would have fallen on their face. They're not thinking about anything. They're just holding the Father's hand, having a good old time, right? We need to have faith in our Heavenly Father and hold His hand and let Him guide us and direct us. And if the, scare, if the street looks scary and there's all kind of cars going back and forth and we're wondering how are we going to get across, oh, it's okay, i got my Father's hand. He'll get me across. You get in that laugh in the dark and you're scared to death and it's dark and scary, you just have to say, wait a minute. I, I, my hand's in the Father's hand. I'll be all right. I'll be all right. That's faith. Trusting God. Believing God. And then the last one, number 10, we should walk to please God. 1 Thessalonians 4.1, Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received us of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. We're supposed to walk to please God. Who are you trying to please? Who are you living for? If you're living first and foremost for your spouse, wrong. If you're living first and foremost for your kids, wrong. If you're living first and foremost for your parents, wrong. You live first and foremost for God. Because He's the only one who's perfect. He loves you with a love that goes so far beyond your relatives and your, your, your nuclear family that it is like between night and day. Walk to please Him. There's a call to walk. There's a character to our walk. And then there is the course of our walk that we should walk in. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And as we're thinking about these things... They're right there in the Bible. And you know when you hear them, they're good. You know when you hear them, they're right. And God's given them to us so that they could be like a checklist, like a, that we could look at ourselves and our lives and then look at the Scripture and say, you know what, I need to tweak this and tweak that. I need to change this and change that. I need to straighten this out. and uh, Boy, I need to work on this. When we walk worthy of God, we will have the blessings and the victories, and the peace that passes all understanding. Maybe tonight, dear Christian, you need to come and just get before God and say, Lord, I want to walk that walk. I'm stumbling a little bit. I might be a little off course. There's things I need to change and add and take out and all that, but Lord, you help me through it. I know we can do it together. Maybe you're here tonight and you, you just need that new life, first of all. All these things are part of the new life. That you can't even imagine or begin to partake in unless you have Christ as your Savior. You have that new life in Jesus. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, you know what, preacher? I need to trust Christ alone and completely for the salvation of my soul and the forgiveness of my sins. No one else, nothing else, just Jesus. Well, you know what? The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can call on the Lord Jesus right where you sit. 
and ask him to forgive your sins and save your soul. I'd like to help you. Say, preacher, I'll pray with you. I'll trust Christ. I'll ask him to come into my heart and life. I want that new life too. Well, if that's what you'd like to do, we could pray together. You look up at me right now. Just looking at me. I'll know. Nobody else is looking. Just you and me and the Lord. And I'll see your eyes. You'll see my eyes. And I'll know that that's what you want to do. You're ready to trust Christ. You're ready to be saved. You want to ask Jesus to forgive you and be your Savior. Anybody like that here tonight? Put all your eggs in one basket. Anybody like that? If you're watching or listening, you need to do that. You need to trust Christ. Pray and ask him to forgive your sins, save your soul, and come into your life as your Savior. Father, we thank you tonight. Lord, there's so much for us that we just never get hold of. You have so many things for us that we never receive because we, we're not walking worthy. You can't love us any more than you do. But we could be blessed. And you can be better pleased with us. And that should be the goal of our life. Help us tonight to come and say, Lord, I want to be more like Jesus. Help me to walk that walk, to keep a close check. And Father, may you bless the invitation as only you can. We'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing that closing hymn. 549, Jesus is calling. He is. He's calling you to that worthy walk. Maybe there's something about your walk that he's calling you to change, calling to add, calling to tweak, calling to just adjust a little bit. Or maybe there's some big adjustments need to be made. Only you and God know that. But now's the time, this is the place to really talk to God about it. Make those decisions that God has put upon your heart while they're fresh and while they're, while they're stirring you. Once you get out that door and get in the world, it'll start confusing you and it'll start distracting you and you'll forget all about it. That's what the altar calls for. It's for you. We're going to sing that first stanza. You come as the Lord leads, would you? If you need to be saved, you have questions about it, come and see me. We'll help you. You come right now and get saved if you need to. Jesus is tenderly calling the home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will the roam farther and farther away? Calling Judea, calling Judea, Jesus is calling his ten. Close us in prayer. <clears throat> Thank you, Father God, for this unspeakable gift that you have given to us, Lord God. And Father, it's so easy to forget what you've done for us, Lord, and what you suffered for us, Lord, and that forgiveness that you've given to us, Lord. 
Father, help us to uh, live life in such a manner that when people look at us, they would see Jesus, Father God. As Pastor said, we're not perfect, but you have given us a new life and the new abilities to live that life, Father God. So help us to uh, avail ourselves of that through your word, Father God, that we would strengthen ourselves and strengthen our inner man, Father God, in the word of God. And we'll praise you and thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Prayer time to follow, service.